fans of the Horus Heresy and Warhammer 40,000, thank you very much for joining me for a video about painting miniatures. That is right, do not adjust your viewing device. Do not pinch yourself to wake yourself up from a dream. Perhaps the most requested video I have ever had in the course of doing this channel, which is to do with painting miniatures, well, here we go. We're having a video about painting miniatures. What this video is going to be about is these five Primaris intercessor marines I've painted up in the colors of the Iron Hands chapter, or more specifically, Clan Rauken. And this unit, which is called Squad Valencio, is the first of probably a few tester paint schemes I'm doing to work out a scheme that I'm happy with for then taking and applying to my Forge World collection of Iron Hands Legion troops for the Horus Heresy 30k game. So what we're going to do in this video is first we're going to take a look at the models up close and you know just have a bit of a mosey around the miniatures so to speak and then I'm going to take you through how I painted them so just going through the different techniques, the colours that I used, and maybe even the odd brush that I found handy. I'm pretty happy with how they came out. I think I'll probably characterise these as painted to a good tabletop standard. You know, I'm not trying to paint these to any sort of golden demon winning grade. My aim was also to have a paint scheme that was fairly straightforward and easily repeatable. I have to credit Forge World painter and artist and sculptor Mark Bedford for sharing the recipe for this paint scheme with me a couple of years ago. So yeah, big thank you to him because it's actually worked really well. Without further ado, let's start off by looking at some of the miniatures. And we will start off by taking a look at the squad leader, which is Sergeant Valencio, hence why this is Squad Valencio. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the Flash Gits skit cartoon, you may recognize the name Valencio and the reason I chose it is because I'm using these as test miniatures so they're almost like expendable because I don't want to test paint schemes out on really expensive forge world miniatures that also have taken a long time to assemble and put together. So these are Primaris Marines, these are from the Dark Imperium box set and this is a mixture of the Intercessor Marines. First observation I have to say is the Primaris Marines are really enjoyable to paint. The size and also the detailing and the way that they're laid out just makes it a really enjoyable project to tackle. If you've not painted any and looking for something just to try out I'd really highly recommend them and I really have enjoyed working on these miniatures. And let's see how close we can get in. Here we go, this is Sergeant Valencio, he's armed with a bolt rifle, as the rules have developed to be in the latest Marine Codex, arguably a stalker pattern bolt rifle, the heavy version with which is scoped, but to be quite honest you could play them as any of the three variants should you so wish. So this guy's uh, got the classic helmet off, I'm a dynamic Marine leading my dudes. He's got his helmet on his, uh, on his belt, all of the intercessor marines have got this nice consistency of equipment. They've got this little pouch, which I've imagined as a grenade canister. A couple of purity seals. And a set of equipment pouches. A holstered bolt pistol. And then we've got a very distinctive power pack. I've used some transfers for their chapter insignia. And these are taken from the Forge World Iron Hands Legion transfer set. And these are beautiful transfers. They've applied really well. They look great. There's a close, a close second probably get in with the camera focus. We've got an Iron Hands Insignia, although you know these are Legion 30k, they work fine for 40k, uh, better than anything that Games Workshop do for 40k Insignia. And here is his clan symbol on his right pauldron, which is their clan Rauken. Really nice. Okay, so let's start working left to right. Here's the first of the Battle Brothers. As we work through these, I'll pick out a few of the features of these particular models. The first thing, I like the design of the bolt rifle. You've got this kind of, it's very modern looking. You've got a, shall I say, some sort of composite material casing, and then you've got some uh, workings or the mechanism that pokes through that. And I've just used those details to pick out different details of the weapon. They look really good. I do like the Pitkinny rail. Uh, style design that runs along the top, very modern looking. I drilled all the barrels out on my bolt rifles. I think that worked really well. If you look in my how to modeling videos, there's a whole series of videos about preparing the Primaris Marines, doing all the details, clean up, 
getting rid of the mold lines and doing things like boring out the bolt rifle barrels as well. So yeah, worth checking out if you're interested. Do have a the helmet's very Mark IV inspired. I do like uh, I do like the look of it. With doing these, I wasn't too bothered about adding any squad insignia or anything. I could always go back and add something in, but they're distinctive enough uh, to not really need it. And when it's testers, I'm not overly, or concept paint scheme models, I'm not overly worried about doing that. Let's have a look at the second Marine. Now on this guy, I painted the lenses on his uh, helmet slightly different to the other guys. So I did, I was trying to do the kind of, or the highlight at one end and then a single white dot on the other side, which I don't know, it was all right. I need to get myself a new, very fine detail brush to be able to execute this properly. I mean, it, to be honest, it came out okay, but I think this approach with painting the highlight in a line on the lower half of the lens, uh, which is how I did most of them, worked out better. I think that is probably going to be my style for a lot of the miniatures I do do. I do like the consistency of the extra equipment these Marines have. Very well done. I guess it has to be said that the additional size does make them that bit easier to paint as well. So here we have the third of the Battle Brothers in the squad, or third of the standard troops. For those of you who follow me on Twitter, you'll seen this guy a few times. I uh, gave this guy the name of Brother Hinterstoisser, uh, which is named after a German climber, if you're interested in that sort of thing. If you do like to see work in progress shots of things like this, and you know, I will be doing more painting projects, do follow me on Twitter because that's where I share my images. Some people don't like Twitter. I found, and you know, I, I share a lot of skepticism about it, but I found for the gaming community, and the hobbying community, it's actually a really good place and there's lots of really positive people and there's none of the nonsense that it's famous for or infamous for. If you do you know, like to see me doing work in progress, that's a great way to keep a track of it by following me on my Twitter account. So here I have another Marine. Nice little details, uh, like these control doohickeys on the forearm. Some of these guys have it on the left hand side as this guy does, some have it on the right. This guy's got, got an additional pouch on his holstered bolt pistol. Perhaps it's a spare magazine for the weapon. Another purity seal. Yeah, really good. I do think they've, uh, they paint up very nicely, these Primaris Marines. And here's a fifth and final member of the squad. This is a miniature that I reposed. A lot of the Primaris Marines have got their, they sort of look like they're looking down at their, they're, they're trying to look at their chest hair or something. Um, so I cut and reposed a lot of the heads and on this guy I raised it. So he's looking forward and I think it looks much better as a result. Yeah, really dynamic pose as opposed to quite a, a little bit of a static one otherwise. As you can see on the bases, I mean, I use very simple technique. I use some, uh, this is actually chinchilla sand. <laughs> we haven't got any chinchillas, but we do have some uh, dwarf hamsters. And I just nabbed a bit of a sand to base them with, which worked well. I just used a few pebbles to break up the base a bit. I'm probably gonna try some other techniques around basing as well as I go on. There we go. So there's a quick look around the squad. I hope you like how they've turned out. I'm certainly pleased with them. Now I'm going to talk about how I actually painted these guys and the technique I used. And as I do that, I'm going to show the paints that I used and we'll probably just line them up at the back as we sort of progress. These are iron hands. And as you can probably guess, I started out with a black base coat, which is uh, quite obvious. And in this case, it was good old abaddon black. So there you go. Now, I'm not particularly wanting to advocate Citadel paints as being the best paint
paints to use because there are lots of options out there. You've got Vallejo, you've got Army Painter, you've got uh, P3, you've got Cut the Arms, and then you've also got things like Ravel and Tamiya in the, shall we say, more military model style of things. So there's an enormous amount of range there, but I only had a handful of Citadel paint, so I've tried to do this with a fairly basic set of paints and palettes. If you're wanting to do this, you can modify the choice of colours and the manufacturer accordingly. So I'm going to frame this, although I'll talk about the Citadel colour names, I'll frame this in terms of the style of colour I was wanting to use and the reason for that as well. So if you like to paint with Vallejo or Tamiya, you can find similar paints which will do the same effect. Started out with a base coat of Abaddon Black. I didn't spray these. Very important thing, two thin coats. <laughs> yeah, thanks Duncan. I use some of this Lyman medium to thin the Abaddon Black as opposed to water. I found that worked really well and it kept this paint mobile while I was applying it and also nice and thin. And I hope from what you can see with what I've shown you, I've got a nice consistency, even coats and no evidence of brush marks or anything, hardly any evidence. I mean, there might be the odd thing in there. So yeah, so that was a starting point. A base coat, two base coats of Abaddon Black thinned with Lamian Medium. The next step was to apply a dry brush layer. And this was kind of like a very important and significant part with how this paint scheme works. Now, black can be quite tricky to highlight really, because if you go with the natural white effect, you're going to end up with something that's gray. And inevitably it's going to have a habit of looking like slate uh, or some form of dark rock or perhaps a volcanic rock like a basalt. I didn't want that. And the paint scheme that I got for these certainly uh, gave an alternate way of doing that. So instead of using greys to highlight, we used metallics. And the highlight was done with lead belcher. Now lead belcher is kind of like, it's a dark metallic, but it's also got a touch of brown in it. And if you've ever handled lead, you will know that actually kind of the clues in the name, this is a color that does actually resemble lead quite well. So what I did was I applied a heavy dry brush to the whole model using lead belcher. And to do this, I actually picked up a Citadel paintbrush. I don't normally buy Citadel paintbrushes, but I saw this one and I like the look of it. And it was this one here, which is, a, I think it's a large dry brush. Uh, yeah, there we go, large dry. And it's got these nice, short, but quite stout bristles. I found this worked really well for applying the lead belcher dry brush to the model. As always with dry brushing, you need to be careful to get enough paint off because otherwise it'll you know splurge and it'll it won't look good. Work that into the model. When I was dry brushing, I focused on the armored areas. I applied less heavy dry brushing to the casing of the bolt rifles. Let me try and get another one that might uh, show that a bit better. Yeah, and if you can probably, well, I hope you can see that with the bolt rifles, they're a, a tone or two darker than the dry brush highlighted areas of the armor. It was deliberate. I did that to, well, to start with, I was thinking of painting the casings in a separate color or perhaps repainting them black. But as I was going, I thought, oh, well, I'll just put, I put a gentle dry brush on them and it actually worked quite well. Well, it worked really well, actually, as far as I'm concerned on this. It made the whole technique very quickly because the entire effect was achieved in one round of dry brushing. Very useful that was. And yeah, I really like this colour lead belt. And really sets the, the miniature up well. Great way of highlighting the black, uh, you know, giving a wide area highlight that doesn't involve bringing white into the model. I'm not criticising the approach of bringing white in, but these are iron hands and the clue is in the chapter name. They're an iron-coloured armour, I think, as opposed to more of a, uh, a charcoal-coloured armour, shall we say. The next step was to apply a wash. Once you dry brush them, it's quite heavy, and you end up with a lot of streaks. Even if you do it, you know, I mean, I was quite careful. You still end up with streakiness and roughness, so you need something to tone all that back in. And to do this, I employed the services of the ubiquitous Nuln oil. And this is very straightforward. I applied a shade coat over the whole model with Nuln oil. When I did this, I was careful to avoid allowing the Nuln oil to pool too much in any location. So while it was a wash and it was going over the whole model, 
I was careful to evenly layer the wash over the whole model. And then once I'd applied it and I went back over, kind of like I, I washed them all, went back over and just checked to see if there were any areas where the oil had pooled. Where that had happened, I just went back in with my brush and removed some. Otherwise, with Null Oil, which is a paint that has a slight viscosity to it, it's got quite interesting characteristics. For people who've worked with Tamiya Smoke, it's like a much less severe version of Tamiya Smoke for its viscosity effects. It certainly does share them with Tamiya Smoke. And you want to be careful with the pooling, because if it pools, you can then get relief, and that is going to look bad later on in the model's life. So I just went back over and took away that excess. Once the first coat of Null Oil was completely dry, I then went back and did the same thing again. And this is really important, yeah? You need to do this twice because the first coat won't smooth the dry brushing out to a sufficient degree. You'll still have too much roughness there and it'll still be quite a bit too light. So yeah, you do the whole thing a second time over. Next step is actually something you probably won't expect and that required the use of a can of clear lacquer. So this is Halford's clear lacquer. It costs about, I think this was, was this about 750 for this can? And this is a huge can, this is 500 milliliters. And what I did with the clear lacquer was I simply applied it over the whole model. And now at this point I hear you asking, well, why'd you do that? Well, there's two reasons, I think. The first reason is it fixes the null oil in position. Null oil, and once you put it on, I think it remains semi-soluble to later paint applications. So it does have a habit of uh, coming away. The other thing as well is it also gives it a protective layer. I did a lot of handling of these miniatures as I was going along and having that lacquer layer on it just meant I could handle the miniatures more and not worry about any rubbing off or losing the paint. It also then meant that when I came to do the silver, it was easier to clean up mistakes because you were putting it onto a gloss layer. And if you go a little bit wrong and if you're quick, you can get in there with a brush and just wipe out the excess paint. A single coat of Halford's gloss lacquer was the next step of the process. The next thing to do was work on the silver details. Now, I've used three silvers for the details. The first is the Citadel layer paint, which is Storm Host Silver. So this I would describe as being a brilliant silver. It's very bright. I then had this one, another layer paint, which is Iron Breaker. And I'd describe this as being a medium sort of, I don't know, medium steely color. Yeah, probably steel color. Untreated steel type shade, whereas this might be more a aluminium or chrome type color. And then the third one I used was again, I went back to the lead belcher. And I'll just show you the three ways I use these paints. So firstly, let's talk about the Stormhost Silver. So the Stormhost Silver, I in effect use for armor trim and very bright highlights I wanted. So the armor trim, as you can see, is a piping on the pauldrons. These plates on the knee pads. I picked those out, not because I don't know if they'll ever be, I don't know if they are a decorative feature, but with working with black, obviously you've got quite dark models and I wanted something in the lower half of the miniature to stand out and break up the silhouette. So I chose those two features. Actually, I think it worked really rather well. Overall, I think it really does breaks that model up and brings it to life a bit more. I also used the Stormhost Silver to paint the buckle on the belt, if we call it a belt. And I also painted the Pitikini rail. That was also done in Stormhost Silver. And finally, these two little nod jewels on the top of the power pack. They were also picked out in Stormhost Silver. So that was a Stormhost Silver. Working our way up the metals. The next one was Iron Breaker. And I use this to paint, shall we say, the furniture on the guns, the rifle furniture. So this section of the mechanism here, the magazine, the return handle, this little doohickey here, the scope on the rifles where they had them, the magazine release catch, the barrel, the gas valve, I guess it's a gas valve or whatever it is on this thing. Let's imagine it as a gas valve. All of those I picked out in Iron Breaker. That looked good. I also painted the Aquila in Iron Breaker as well. Quite often Aquila are picked out in white or yellow or something like that. For the iron hands, I think they needed to be silver because white would have just broken it up too much. Uh, I didn't want to 
have too heavy contrasts on these miniatures. And so I don't think it's the character of what the Iron Hands are like. But that's just my take. You know, you can do it your own way, of course. And then finally, returning to Lead Belcher. Again, I wanted to pick out a detail on the lower half, but I wanted it to be more subtle. So I went and simply repainted these ankle actuators with Lead Belcher. It's quite a subtle detail, but again, it just breaks up the black on the lower half of the model a bit. So I did all that work with all the silvers, and then the next step was to take our friend Null Oil and reapply that to all of the silver that I just picked out. So in a went, dip, 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 and done. The next step was then to move on to the edge highlights. So the edge highlights I did almost exclusively with Stormhost Silver. Now, there's all sorts of ways you can do edge highlights. And there's many techniques, there's chipping techniques, there's sort of scuffing techniques, all these ideas you can do. My thematic take on this was that my iron hands, their war gear is very heavily used, but it's also extremely carefully looked after and treated with great care and reverence. I wanted to create a look of armor that appeared as if it had been used a lot, but carefully maintained. And the way I aimed to achieve that was by carefully applying some edge highlights using Stormhost Silver to various parts of the model. And it might be a little bit tricky to pick this out in the light. You can see on like the upper surfaces here of the arm of the um, forearm armor, I've done some fine edge highlights there. Edge highlight around the collar, edges of the, the top of the visor, the ridge of the helmet, side of the helmet, um, this assembly on the top, edges of the backpack edges of these exhaust vents on the back, these exhaust vents, here, here, edge highlights on the armor plates. There's some more around the armor there you can see. Let's pick another model to look at. We'll do this guy. You can see I, I applied it a bit more heavily on this guy here. The idea was to create the effect of whatever the blackening that they use on the armor had worn away over time, but it was kind of like, it's, it wasn't your typical pain. It was kind of like more of a lacquer or something, or a stain almost perhaps. And it is gradually worn with time and use on the most exposed areas. Doing things like there, like picking out the trigger finger, is a slight visual trick, but it just draws attention to that part of the model. You can see some more there. So there's quite a lot to do there. As is the case with edge highlighting, you can do either a little bit or you can do quite a lot. I did a fair amount, but I kept it reasonably low key. I wasn't wanting them to look really gaudy and overpowering. I didn't then reapply another wash over the edge highlights. I just left it at that. I did the edge highlights and then it was a case of moving on to the finer details. Oh, who should I have this time? Let's have the, let's actually have, is it this guy? No, that's fine. Yeah, I'll do this guy. The next thing was to pick out the pouches. This was an opportunity to bring a little bit of red into the miniature in the form of some leather pouches. Again, I was wanting to create the impression of well-maintained but worn with time equipment. What I did for the pouches is I painted them with Mournfang Brown, which is a Citadel base paint. And I then gave them a wash of some Mournfang Brown. I then gave them a wash of Mournfang Brown combined with Nuln Oil. Let it dry. And then I mixed some Mournfang Brown up again with maybe I think it was just a touch of Nuln Oil if I remember rightly. And I went back over and with a slightly weak paint, so it wasn't kind of like as strong as the original colour, I went over it and it kind of just let some of the dark poke through. And that was to create an impression of a slightly uneven and 
natural material, which obviously leather is. And, you know, leather acquires a patina as it ages and gets used. And I was trying to create that sort of inconsistency of the colour, which seemed to work quite well, actually. Then I mixed some highlights. And for this, oh, I think I used Graveyard Earth. Was it Graveyard Earth or was it Xandra Dust? Hmm. It was one of these two and I can't quite remember. It might actually have been, was it Xandra Dust? And mix that in with the Mournfang Brown. And then taking that, I did some edge, let me find a good one. There we go, here we are, a good one. So we've got lots. I did some edge highlighting on all the sharp edges of the equipment pouches, as you can see. And again, that was just creating the, building up the patina of natural use on the leather pouch. As the equipment pouches, I then had the grenade canisters to paint. You could paint these in all sorts of color. Again, I used it as an opportunity to bring in a color that hadn't previously got on the model and wasn't going to get on the model, which was green. And there you go, you can see the finished canister. And I painted that with wire flesh as a base. I then gave it a wash of null oil, which seems to be a, a common feature of this model. And then I applied some Xandra dust with the wire flesh, mixed the highlight and painted the highlight over the whole thing. And obviously leaving the recesses dark. The next thing was to go back and pick out all the catches and latches on the pouches. And uh, the way I did that is I mixed some Abaddon Black with Mournfang Brown. Watered it down a little. So it wasn't a wash, but it wasn't you know the solid pigment. And I then used that to pick out basically the area of the catch. So that was dark, but I didn't want stark black because it was going to be too stark against the leather effect. And then once I'd done that, I went back in with the Stormhost Silver and picked out the latches and catches on those pouches. Which I did fairly neatly. I could probably do that more neatly if I spent more time on it. Well, I could do, but I just wanted to get it done. Still, I'm quite pleased with it. And yeah, as I said, these aren't competition quality miniatures, I don't think. So that was those details. Let's think what we did next. Ah, right, scopes. This is quite a little subtle detail. You see here we've got the, the scope on the Stalker bolt rifle. What I did on this was I painted the lens in using a bad and black. And then very carefully with some of the ceramite white, I just put a little dot on it to represent the light catching the bright polished lens. There are a couple of ways you could you could pick out lenses in all sorts of different ways. But I just thought I'd do that as a fairly subtle little detail. Yeah, had quite a bit of fun doing that one. Next was picking out these little wrist details. So again, I used this as a chance to bring in some colours that weren't getting used much in the rest of the model. So I did a, a dot of red, which I think was Mephiston red, which I haven't actually got to hand at the moment. But yeah, Mephiston red topped with some golden yellow. And then the blue I did... Ha, <laughs> here's a retro paint. Look what I found in my box. Deadly Nightshade. That must be over 20 years old. And then some Enchanted Blue to pick out the blue diode as well. And again, it's a subtle way to bring some colours into the model that weren't otherwise going to be there. Now let's talk about the eye lenses. For the eye lenses, I started off with a base of Deadly Nightshade, so like a Midnight Blue. Uh, or a, almost like a navy blue, an ink blue perhaps. Then I painted a series of successive lead highlights on, working through enchanted blue uh, and adding a little bit of ceramite white in as well, just to lighten it. So at this point, the model was quite well advanced. Um, a lot of the painting work was now complete and we're moving into like the latter stages of the paint job. As you've noticed, we've got some purity seals. I won't do him because he's broke. Let's have a look. Uh, that's not the easiest one to see. Let's use Sarge. So the purity seals I picked out 
Um, I picked them out. I think it was in Graveyard Earth, was it? I did them. Was it the Mournfang Brown? I just forget now. I think it may be Mournfang Brown. So I did the Mournfang Brown. Then I did the highlights with, I think, some Graveyard Earth, Xandra Dust, and then mixing some white in as well. I did a lot of colour mixing on these models. They're okay. I could have done these a lot more neatly and more interestingly. I could have put text and scrolls on them, but it was just really a tester. And I'm not really imagining having much in the way of purity seal work to do on my actual Legion troops. So it wasn't a big concern of mine for these. Now, in terms of the purity seal itself, I painted it in Mephiston red. I then gave it a wash of Null Oil. I then went back and edge highlighted it with Mephiston red. I then mixed in some golden yellow into the Mephiston red just a little bit to turn it bring it up to an orange and then did another edge highlight very fine this time just to make it pop a little bit so at this point it was getting pretty close to done I'm just thinking of other things I did I might have just picked out a little bit of detail on the skull um, there we go yeah I think use some Stormhole silver just to pick out the high areas of the skull and then it was actually time to paint the face of the sergeant i didn't have any flesh tone paint so i mixed my own i wanted to do him very pale skinned with really striking bleached blonde hair and i wanted him to look healthy as well some people like to paint iron hands looking a little bit shall i say borg like i wanted my guy to look healthy and fresh because the primaris is something new and they've not undergone all the cybernetic enhancement that Iron Hands coming will do. So I wanted to, you know, bring that idea in. But also a really strong contrast to the dark armour with the pale skin and the very pale hair as well. The actual way I mix the flesh is I think I used a little bit of yellow, some white and a little bit of Mephiston red and just blended the right colour. Flesh tones are actually quite easy to mix and it's quite a handy skill to have if you know how to mix a flesh tone because as you can see you can get a good effect without actually having a flesh paint. There are disadvantages to that because you have to mix, remix the colour every time you want to do it but you know it just shows it can be done. I did some washes on the face and I think I was using to use some red and some brown maybe this to wash in the details and then I went through a series of progressive highlighting just picking out the edges and the details of the face and I was really quite pleased with how that came out it's a very good face there's lots of detail to it the paint was a little bit chalky there a little bit of texture that I probably didn't want there but yeah never mind for the eyes I was going to paint the eyes in and do the pupils but I was struggling to get an angle and I didn't have the best brush. On Twitter, funnily enough, I read a good hint from an ex-Games Workshop painter of many years ago, or Games Workshop painter and artist, Gary Chalk, and he suggested just painting the eye socket in, in a dark brown. And that's what I did. And I think with his heavy set brow, it works really rather well, that. Yeah. Interesting little technique. I then moved on to his hair. For the hair, I mixed in some of the yellow and Xandra dust into the white mixed his hair tone, painted that, and then progressively highlighted it up working through the whites. And you can probably see that I stapled some texture onto it. The problem with these kind of like basic hairdos, they don't have a great deal of surface detail. So you have to do something to put that in. With it being a white, blonde white hairdo, you kind of get away with that because you're not expecting as much contrast within the hair as you might do with certain hair tones. And then once I'd finished painting the hair, I just mixed, I think it was a bit of this Mournfang brown into a thin wash. And then I just picked out the hairline just to sort of uh, give that contrast line between the hair and the face. Then finally I went back with some uh, black Stormhole silver, cleaned up around uh, the armor, just edged that in a bit, put some highlighting back on. It came out very nice. It's got a little bit of something on it there. I need to touch that bit up. I wonder what that was. Hmm. And at that point, the painting work was pretty much done on the models. I think I've covered everything I did. Right, let's talk about transfers now. For the transfers, I used the Forge World Iron Hands Legion sheet, as I'd said before. The thing with transfers is you've got two issues. You've got the fact it is a thin film 
and is going to attach on uh, to a flat surface. And then the second challenge you've got is the fact that with Space Marines and a whole variety of other troops, but Space Marines are an excellent example of this challenge, is the shoulder pads and the leg pads, where they often wear insignia, are curved surfaces with a lot of relief. And many people find getting transfers on quite challenging. So the solution here is, or my solution was to use Microsol, which is like a solution which softens transfers and gives and profiles on, on. And they advertise it as creating the painted on look. And having used it, I think, yeah, that's not too bad. There's, there is a slight edge visible. If you get really close and scrutinize them, you can just see the edge, but you have to get really close and scrutinize them a lot. And the way I did these is I cut each transfer out individually. I did them one at a time, put them in water, allowed them to soften. Once they were mobile, I positioned it onto the shoulder pad. I had to chase the transfer around the shoulder pad quite a lot. And once I got it in position, I then took some Microsol, a little bit of Microsol, you don't need a lot, but a bit of Microsol, and just dabbed it onto the transfer to soften it. Once you apply the Microsol, the transfer will go quite wrinkly and it will also soften so you don't want to be maneuvering it after you've applied the microsol because they're extremely fragile and on this first one i did i did actually rip a bit off i mean that's obviously just battle damage isn't it but the real reason for that is i just noticed i need to reposition it slightly and that bit came away because it was softened by microsol you then need to let the transfer set i actually used a a stream of hot air from a heater to accelerate mine along. I don't know if I'd use a hairdryer, but a gentle current of warm air if you're somewhere cold and it dries off and it basically just, it, it just, as it dries, it just pulls the transfer really taut and flat. And it did it really well. I then went around and just made sure there was no proud bits or a, a couple of tiny little proud bits, which I just, I think I might have just snipped away with a very sharp scalpel just to take that off. That worked uh, really rather well. So overall, the transfers, I mean, the transfers seem to be of a decent quality. They're not too thick and heavy. And coupled with the Microsol, brilliant result. Really pleased with those. Not used Microsol before, um, but yeah, it certainly does work. There are other transfer solutions available. I mean, Tamiya do a decal application solution I'm aware of, and I'm sure there are others. There's another product called Microset, which I think is kind of like an adhesive. I didn't use that. I found the adhesive they came with to work fine. But, you know, I know some people use Microset as well as Microsol and find it gives good results. The next thing to do was a tip from a someone on Twitter or someone on stream, which is uh, AV6 Scott. And they do a really good Twitch stream, actually, um, on a Monday, Wednesday and Sunday morning. They're in Texas, so they're in a slightly different time zone to me. Also, um, Nichols as well. Uh, I'll leave a link it, to their Twitch channel. So I, I watch it quite a lot at the moment um, when I'm painting, it's great inspiration. But his top tip was then to apply another layer of the clear lacquer over the transfer to help profile it onto the shoulder pad. Yes, I did that. And I think that actually helped with getting this nice smooth finish. And I could see you could, you, I mean, I did one coat, but you could probably apply a second if you're, if you're sparing and precise and it blends it in. There's a whole host of techniques going in there to get these transfers nicely profiled. You've got the, the Microsol, then you've got the clear lacquer to, to kind of smooth it all off. Very nice. Now the miniature is pretty much done and the final bit was to do the base. So I was very slapdash with the base. I was with my mate's house. I had the chinchilla sand or you could use all sorts of sand. I used chinchilla sand, it was, well, I had it to hand, it was also quite fine, so it worked quite nicely. And I put it on with some really cheap kids PVA, not very professional, but it worked, and it goes to show that, you know, cheap blues can work. It had the quite pleasant effect of when I then painted it, it cracked a bit. I don't know if you can see it much in the final iteration, but yeah, it did crack a bit, which was quite nice because, and I was wanting a bit of a salt crust type look, so that was quite neat. So as a base layer, I used Xandra dust mixed with some ceramite white, and I watered it down. I didn't use the uh, Lamian medium, and did uh, paint that on the base. I did two coats, I think, yes, and then I did a wash, and for my wash, I took some graveyard earth and mixed it in with some null oil and then applied that to the base 
I then did a series of dry brush highlights. Uh, used quite a small dry brush to do this, not a, this big beast. And I dry brushed with Xandra Dust. And I did, what did I do? I think, did I do two layers of this? I think I might have done two passes. So I did Xandra Dust and White. I did three actually. I did Xandra Dust and White, more White and Xandra Dust. So that was, you know, about half, half as little again on the Xandra dust so it's quite pale and then finally using a very small dry brush I went back and just put some very fine white tips onto the salt and the reason I did that is I wanted to create the impression of perhaps like an evaporation type salt pan environment and what you get in those is at the top of kind of like detritus on the ground you do get little bits of salt crystallizing. It's kind of like on the tops and stuff. And I just wanted to create that effect with that final dry brush. Having done that, I then needed to reintroduce some definition around the feet of the Marine because the kind of the Space Marine's feet get a little bit sucked into the sand. And to do that, I took again the Graveyard Earth, I think. Yes, Graveyard Earth, mixed it with some Null Oil, watered down a bit, and then just inked around the feet to create that shadow. And I also did the same on the little clusters of rocks. The clusters of rocks were just some random bits of gravel. I think, I don't it must have been some sort of budgie grit or something or some sort. Or maybe it was aquarium gravel actually. Coarse aquarium gravel. I can't remember, I had a bag of it from years ago. I just stuck those on with some PVA. I used good quality wood glue to stick those on because the cheap glue I used for the sand probably wouldn't have been strong enough. So at that point, we're pretty much done. I then decided I wanted to give some contrast on the base with these rocks. And I thought, well, let's get some gray in here. And this is kind of like the geologist in me speaking. I mean, studied geology at university. And one thing you do often notice is a lot of sand and sandy environments come out of rocks that are gray to various degrees. And what happens is, you know, there may be three minerals that make up this rock. The one that gives it the gray color, so perhaps a black mica, completely dissolves in the weathering process, leaving the white and the sandy colored minerals to form the actual sand. So I decided, well, I'm gonna put the gray rocks in, a different color to the browner base, but there's also a nice, kind of like in my mind, a nice bit of science behind that as well, in terms of how environmental evolution works and the colors of those environments. So to do the gray, I just simply mixed some abaddon black with ceramite white. I did it as quite a thin, layer it allowed a little bit of detail to poke through from the early colors and i just simply painted it in one coat and then i went back with some ceramite white and just dry brush that on the top very simple but again it just creates a little bit of contrast so we're very nearly done we really are nearly done now the final thing to do is put the edge on the base because this is a part a place a model that's going to get some wear. I went digging in my paint box and I found this with some Tamiya acrylic. Now Tamiya acrylics are lacquers, so they're harder wearing if you apply them right. These have a solvent base in them, so they have some denatured alcohol in them uh, to keep them mobile. And with Tamiya paints is, if you apply thin layers, you can get some really smooth, even finishes. They're great for airbrushing, really, really good for airbrushing. And as you can see on the edges, got some really nice smooth finish. And the way I did that is, I, so I had my buff, and then I took some Amia thinners, so this is a denatured alcohol, X20A thinners, and I thinned this down quite significantly with it. So I had quite a thin, it wasn't a wash, but it was a, certainly wasn't full thickness, nowhere near full thickness. And I then applied several thin coats, and actually it was a total of, I think, four coats I went round and just gradually built the colour depth up but the end result was it was a lovely smooth finish all around I think did I even get as far as doing five coats I think it may have got as far as five and that was just the finishing touch using the Tamiya buff let's put all those paints in shot and despite what I thought was going to be a fairly simple paint scheme I ended up using one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen different paints the final step was to apply matte varnish I use Citadel's Purity Seal. This is a matte varnish. You get it in this great big can, costs about a tenner. Not too badly priced, I suppose, compared to some. Now, Purity Seal has a bit of a reputation for being the graveyard of nicely finished models. And that is due to, it can cloud up when you apply it. Now, I've had various clouding up experiences with matte varnishes in the past. And I 
wouldn't necessarily say it's a particular criticism of this one in itself. It's a general issue matte varnishes, they do have this tendency to cloud. And I think in particular it's due to the temperature in which you apply them. And here it does know, spray between 15 and 25 degrees C. I guess in particular don't spray in conditions that are too cold. So what I did was I took my can of purity seal and half an hour before I was sealing them, I stood it in a tub of warm water to warm the paint up. I then gave it a really good shake. This is kind of like your shaky rattle pan. Gave it a really good shake to get all the paint mixed up. Put my models on the board. I sprayed it in my garage because obviously this stuff has, it's got a lot of solvents in, so it's not suitable for using inside. I applied the varnish and then I brought the models back into the main warmer part of the house. I didn't leave them to dry in the cold. At the same time, I wasn't spraying the varnish in the living area of the house. I brought them back in and as you can see, the varnish has done its job perfectly. I've got a lovely matte, even coat with no evidence of clouding whatsoever. So that was a, a great finish to the paint job and that worked really, really well. I think that wraps up this video, talking about how I've done my first squad of Primaris Intercessor Marines, a test paint scheme, Squad Valencio, for my Iron Hands Legion Force. I hope you've enjoyed that. I'm not the greatest painter in the world by a long shot. I don't think I'm too bad. And also I hope, as I often try to do in my modeling, is just trying to demonstrate how you can get really nice results without going too complicated in terms of your materials or your equipment. Sometimes it's just by knowing clever techniques that you can get great results. Obviously, if you've got the best gear, the best techniques and the most skill, that's even better. Hopefully this is a demo of how to get something looking really nice with a fairly modest input, shall we say. Let me know what you think in the comments as always. And yeah, I'm sure I'll be doing lots more about painting as this year moves on. My resolution for 2018 is it is going to be the year of painting. After being distracted by building armies for the last three or four years, 2018 is going to be my painting year. But other than that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for watching. I'll speak to you next time and goodbye.